Good evening, everybody. Can uh, some uh, one of our members of our team confirm that we are we are good? You are a go, Nate Shannon. Goodness. Okay. Well, welcome. Oh my goodness, Is there, I, I'm I'm nervous. I'm nervous for us. I'm sorry. I've got a couple of screens going here in our Gosherm Studios, but uh, excited to have everybody back on behalf of the. Uh, 2020 Board of Directors. We're glad you're here. Man, do we miss you all. We miss your faces. This uh, this format doesn't do much good for that, but uh, it's great to reconvene here in this first ever online meeting. Uh, we'll ask that you all have uh, patience with us tonight with our technology. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see how this goes. I can tell you the team has been working tirelessly behind the scenes to, to try to pull this off. It's been something we've been talking about for a long time but uh, yet have been forced to, uh, to do it now. So uh, we're, we're great to gather. Uh, we gather like this every month. I, I try to remind you all, as the uh, sole uh, SHRM affiliated chapter in the area, we wanna be your source for creating better workplaces and not necessarily disruption. Um, when we resume, you know, our businesses, uh, like our businesses, our chapter meetings will probably take on a different, um, a different format, a different look, you know, the way we interact with each other, the way we deliver the message. Um, Pam has been working this year. I'm going to introduce Pam here in a few minutes uh, on some off cycle type stuff. So we've been looking to be a little more agile. Well, boy, this has forced us to do that for sure. So um, I wanted to uh, take a quick minute just to, to give a special shout out to a couple of folks, uh, our director of technology, LaTanya, our director of programming, Pam, and director of communications, Janine, and our director of certification, Linda. Uh, have been, and there's been others, the whole board has, has tried to rally behind these folks, but they have really been the four that have taken the uh, the lead on this. So we're grateful for their leadership during this uh, this, this tough time. Uh, it'll be great to resume our chapter meetings, as I said. Uh, it's unfortunate that we're doing it under these circumstances. Uh, we've all been uh, impacted uh, by COVID-19, and uh, we're here to help nav navigate through all of that. And uh, tonight we're going to do that featuring a couple of our board members that we're real excited about, a couple of uh, very knowledgeable men uh, to, uh, to answer some of your questions that you all have submitted. Um, there is a piece missing tonight that we tried to build in, and that was a coping component. Um, we, we know that um, you know the, it, it, this whole thing is starting to take its toll on a lot of us personally and professionally. And we thought we wanted to have a second half of the meeting that uh, was sort of dedicated to coping. But I'm gonna let Pam talk more about that here. I don't wanna steal her thunder. Uh, we've got another complimentary event coming up, uh, I think just a week from now. Uh, I know it's Cinco de Mayo. Uh, you make your jokes, you bring your beverage, uh, whatever it may be, but uh, we, we got another free event that I think will we'll take care of that second component for us uh, before we maybe start to resume our normal cadence. So again, we're glad you're here. Uh, sit back, relax, and engage. Engage with the program. And uh, with that said, I'd like to introduce our Director of Programming, Pam McGee. Have a great meeting, everybody. Hello, thank you, Nate, I appreciate that. Uh, again, I wanna welcome everyone, uh, just as Nate has a lot going on uh, within our communities and so on. Uh, first, I wanna to talk to you about first our agenda that we're gonna be um, going through today and some topics from our directors uh, to let you know what's going on as far as uh, GoSherm and our surrounding communities. Um, so the first thing uh, as far as GoSherm, if you, no one that has an interest to be a sponsor for GoSherm during one of our events, please make sure that you contact C Katrina Williams. You can go to our website and get her information under non-dues and um, she'd be more than happy to take your information and those details for that organization. Next, we have uh, HR Florida, the state conference. As of now, the conference will continue um, at the end of August uh, into the September. Um, they'll let us know if there are any changes. So you still wanna go out there if you have an interest to go out there and make a reservation to attend. Um, our ambassador for that is uh, Amanda Brunson. Um, so you can contact her too um, if you have any additional information. Uh, next is our uh, inclusion and diversity. Um, right now, there are several virtual events that are happening um, that uh, Florida State Council are sponsoring. Uh, several events are actually going to be tomorrow, April 29th. So if you go out to their website, you'll see those events um, that you can also attend if you have an interest. And then next we have Orlando Jobs. Uh, OrlandoJobs.com is having a virtual job fair. It's currently live and it's going to uh, last until at least May 15th. Um, it's 100% complimentary for employers who have jobs that are open during COVID-19. Um, if any GoShare members has a job, please uh, ha uh, have them reach out to Aaron Tuttle. 
And um, Aaron's uh, email is erin at orlandojobs.com. And then the job fair can be assessed at orlandojobs.com uh, slash job fair. And then also another thing that Orlando Jobs has uh, done uh, is start a survey and a survey of employers. And this survey is asking uh, employees about challenges that she has had that uh, they are having during COVID-19 uh, should be released uh, today and you definitely see it tomorrow up on the website so definitely make sure that you go out there to Orlando Jobs and submit any openings that you have and then um, if you are looking for opportunity they do have the virtual uh, job fair going so May 15th again. So next, um, I have the pleasure of introducing two of our uh, distinguished members and actually board members also of GoSherm, and they're going to be giving the presentation today. Um, their topic today is FFRCA and Emergency Leave Administration, and all of this has obviously kicked in, as we know, due to this COVID uh, crisis. Um, so. I want to first uh, tell you a little bit about the gentleman um, presenting today. We have first is going to is uh, Pat Muldowney is a partner at Baker's House Hostlers Orlando Orlando office. Pat advises and represents private and public sector management clients in connection with traditional labor and employment laws. A significant part of Pat's national nationwide practice includes defense of employers and class and collective actions. He's also has defended clients before the National Labor Relations Board, US, uh, um, US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and the Florida Commission on Human Re Relations. Additionally, Pat provides legal advice to clients re relating to their dealings with unions. Then next up, we have Justin McConnell. As an associate of the Orlando Office of Fisher, Fisher Phillips, Justin represents employees in the areas of employment law and civil litigation. Justin has extensive experience in partnering closely with business owners, management, and human resource professionals to maintain issue-free workplace environments and represents employers of varied sizes and in industry. He regularly advises and counsels on matters such as employee handbooks and policies, wage and hour compliance, unemployment harassment, unlawful discrimination, retaliation, non-competitive um, agreements, employee contracts, discipline and termination, as well as diverse matters arising under Title VII. So I wanna welcome Justin and Pat. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Um, thank you both. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, uh, I'm hoping that um, you know we can help help you all out during this difficult time. It's uh, you know these are these are very difficult issues that have been sort of flying by us at a breakneck speed. Um, things you know the legal environment has changed from literally from day to day, and we're going to try to help you out with um, uh, with, with uh, trying to navigate some of the issues that have come up. Um, one thing I was going to say before Justin before we start was. Um, yeah, this is the first time I've worn a collared shirt since March 17th. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you also have that issue uh, or have been in that situation. Um, one thing about doing this reminded me of uh, something that uh, we, both of us have received from a, a judge, a family court judge in Broward County, uh, who uh, sent out the following letter to, to uh, lawyers uh, and the part that's important, and this is really important for, for Zoom meetings, I think generally, is the following. One comment that needs sharing and that the, in, in the judges would appreciate it if lawyers and their clients keep in mind that Zoom hearings are just that, hearings. They are not casual phone conversations. It is amazing how many attorneys appear inappropriately on camera. We've seen many lawyers in casual shirts and blouses with no concern for ill grooming in bedrooms with the master bedroom in the master bed in the background, et cetera. One male lawyer appeared shirtless and one female attorney appeared still in bed under the covers and putting on beach cover up won't cover up the, your poolside in a bathing suit. 
so please, if you don't mind, let's treat court hearings as court hearings, whether Zooming or not. So it's always a, I, think I kind of read that as a cautionary tale for, for this new Zoom environment that we all seem to be in now. So anyway, I share that. Um, Justin, I'll go ahead, I'll let you uh, introduce. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I know you're all disappointed that Pat and I didn't show up in swim trunks and poolside, but, uh, you know, I do want to say good evening to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, Pat and I are just delighted to have this opportunity to reach out and be a resource to everyone that's on the line today. Uh, you know, we, of course, hope you and your families are staying healthy, staying safe, and as the quarantine goes longer, more importantly, staying sane. Uh, you know, again, I'm Justin, I'm with Fisher Phillips, and, uh, you know, we're looking forward to sharing some important information with you about the FFCRA and hopefully have the opportunity to answer some of the important questions that we know you all have. So, thank you. Okay. All right. I guess uh, start with our first slide or second slide, I guess. Um, as Justin mentioned, we uh, we're going to be talking about the Families First Corona, uh, Coronavirus Response Act, which is also known as the FFCRA. Um, this was a law that uh, was signed into uh, in, signed into into law on March 18th. Uh, it is a um, it was something that was passed in breakneck speed, uh, with uh, uh, lots of questions uh, that you know we. And I'm sure you all have been dealing with this issue, trying to figure out what exactly does the law mean? Uh, what what do we have? You know, under this law, what do what do we have to do? Uh, the the law does have two main components: uh, the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Act, which applies primarily to people who um, are unable to who have children who are uh, out of school because of the because of COVID-19. Um, as well as uh, and as well as has no, they don't have child care to, to take care of the kids. Um, again, that's sort of the Emergency Family Medical Leave Expansion Act, and then the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, which deals with that issue, but also we'll talk about deals with other issues related to COVID-19. Came effective April 1st. Uh, is only currently, and hopefully this will be it through ending uh, December 31st, 2020. Uh, the DOL. Uh, did put out regulations in April for, on April 1st. However, from the time the act was was signed into law, the DOL was putting out guidance, uh, frequently asked questions. Uh, almost it seemed like almost every other day, uh, and then they and they continued to do that. And, and as as recently as last week, um, they had uh, sent out FAQs. Um, so the the interpretation of the law, which in and of, in and of itself was somewhat uh, difficult to understand, uh, has been evolving, um, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of weekly evolving. Um, and, um, and so we're going to try to talk a little bit about, you know, where, where we are with that now. So. Okay. So let's first talk about the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. Um, so so here's the gist of it. You have to provide some new form of paid sick leave to employees that are unable to work or telework for qualifying reasons. And as simple as that sounds, uh, we know that this has been far from simple in implementing it and is the reason why the DOL continues to publish multiple FAQs and extensive regulations trying to unwind this. And for all of you who have been scratching your heads over the last few weeks wondering, does this make sense? Uh, we've been doing that too, um, because a lot of this doesn't make sense and we've had to get clarification on what does and doesn't make sense. Um, and I anticipate that as this you know, continues to move forward, we're, we're going to continue to have more questions that need answers. So you know, let's talk first about who are the covered employees that are eligible for this benefit? And you know, who are the employers that have to provide it? So generally speaking, any employee that's working for an employer is a covered employee under the Emergency Paid and Sick Leave Act. Unlike almost every other piece of employment legislation that has ever existed, there is no minimum hours or days requirement. There is no requirement that they be full-time or part-time. They are each eligible. Um, even employees that happen to be on temporary leave, um, your temp employees and even day laborers would be considered 
eligible employees for emergency paid sick leave. Now, some folks who would not count um, would be independent contractors, um, employees who have been laid off or, or furloughed and have not been rehired also do not count as an eligible employee. And for those of you who may have employees that uh, work on an international basis, those who are not actually physically working in a U.S. state or a territory are also excluded from coverage. Um, so let's talk now about who the employers are that have to provide this coverage. So generally speaking, any private employer that has less than 500 employees is going to be considered a covered employer under the act. Um, I don't know if anybody is on the line um, who works with a public employer, but those folks, um, if you are a public employer, you are a covered employer. Um, basically the way the act reads is, if you have at least one employee, you're covered. And I'm not sure how you would um, operate as a public employer without any employees. So um, you know, you're going to be subject to coverage. Um, one question that has come up time and time again is, you know, hey, listen, that's great. We understand how many employees we have to have, but when do we count them? Um, the best way to approach that is to use what's called the snapshot rule. Take account of the number of employees that you have at the time that an, uh, an employee is requesting paid leave under this act. Um, now, this brings up an interesting dilemma because employers who may be hovering around 500 employees are going to want to keep a very close watch on their employee count because at various times they may actually move in and out of coverage. Um, another question that has come up is, let's say that an employee requests emergency paid sick leave. And at the time that they do so, the employer actually has at least 500 employees. But later on, while the employee is on leave, the count happens to drop below 500. So the question is, is this employer still covered and do they have to provide leave? And the answer is yes, that they do. They have to continue to provide leave. Um, now, the reverse is not necessarily true though. If an employee needs leave and the employer has less than 500 employees when the employee actually starts leave, a later increase in the number of employees does not affect the employee's right to continue to leave. So something to think about. One other caveat that I'll draw your attention to here is that those of you who could have employees aggregated with say a subsidiary or a joint employer, this is probably the highest risk area when it comes to um, the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. And the reason is some employers will take the position that they want to exceed 500 employees in order to be exempt from coverage. But of course, if you take that position with respect to this leave, it will have a ripple effect on a number of other employment laws and possible litigation defenses where you would not want to assert joint employer or integrated employer status. So I don't know how many of you may be in that category, but I raise that as a red flag that you may want to think about. Um, another thing we're going to talk a little bit more about later in the presentation is we did get a carve out for those who have less than 50 employees um, in that there is a partial exemption for small businesses with less than 50 employees. And I say a partial exemption because confusingly, only with respect to emergency paid sick leave that would be taken by an employee to care for his or her child due to a school or child care closing, um, an employer can deny that leave if they meet this criteria of, you know, providing the leave would jeopardize the viability of the business. Um, and we will talk more about what those standards are, but just know that that exemption does exist. Um, and I will also say here, this is another higher risk area that you know you should be cognizant of and i would just um, echo what justin said about the issue involving aggregation um i think you know what they're look with the department of labor has indicated is if they're going to look at sort of primarily integrated employer analysis or or a joint employer analysis and you need to look at what your organization looks like if your organization um is is sort of unified if you've got different different companies that are essentially for liability purposes um but they, you know everybody runs through the same hr department and then so all the policies are the same you're probably going to 
get you know you might aggregate you might not be as it might not be as risky to aggregate in that situation because you're probably going to be found to be a integrated employer anyway but that said if it's the other issue is if you've got if you're a holding company and you've got a variety of different a uh, variety of different businesses that are unrelated um you know for instance like a private equity you know private equity firm might have that you know that one you know i i agree with justin that you know you, that's a real risk to 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 start decide to aggregate to get out of this to get out of this law but you're just going to buy yourself a world of litigation after so anyway um so uh let's talk about the emergency paid sick leave act leave entitlement full-time employees are entitled to 80 hours of employer paid sick leave so uh this is something new this is the first this is the first time that really we've seen government mandated paid sick leave um so full-time employees get that part-time employees though it's the average number of hours is, uh that the employee works over a two-week period um you know again you can average it over six months if the number fluctuates so you want to look at your if somebody's regularly scheduled to work 20 hours a week then you know they're going to be entitled to 20 you know to 40 hours of sick pay for the two weeks um but again if somebody works 10 hours one week 15 another 25 the next <clears throat> you're going to want to average it out and figure out on that average how many hours per week there are and then you times that by two because that would be the, the entitlement so okay the now the up uh, um, okay, so what what um, triggers what entitlement what tr what events trigger leave entitlement under the EPSLA? First one is the employee is subject to federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation orders related to COVID nineteen. This becomes this has become tricky when we started seeing stay at home and shelter in place orders. For instance. Uh, Initially, let's say when we had Orange County did it, now of course, obviously the state of Florida has one. Notice it's the employee is subject to it. So if you if you're a business that was not considered an essential business and you were forced to close down during the stay-at-home period as, as a non-essential business, um, the fact that you were required to, to close down did not trigger employee entitlement to leave under the EPSLA. Um, it's really it's a situation you look at the employee so let's say you and some of these stay at home orders you've got situations where the you know it says you know elderly employee eld, you know senior citizens and persons with underlying medical conditions are required to stay home if there's no exception for that let's say you're in a situation where the employee is subject to the order subject to staying home but you're open as an as a, as a uh, as a business and could that person could work, but but for the stay at home order, that's going to be considered an isolation or quarantine order. Um, and and I know um, I, there uh, there was a um, uh, there was a letter sent by de um, Democratic leaders in the in the in the Congress to the DOL when that came out. They were hopping mad about that. They were like, what? That, that they they felt that defeated the purpose of the act. But here the you know the DOL is trying to rein in. A statute that was crafted very quickly, very uh, you know, uh, trying to do the right things, but not necessarily thinking through all the consequences. So the DOL, and that's kind of the reason why we've been seeing the DOL constantly put out guidance because they're trying to refine it, you know, and 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 trying to actually, in a lot of sense, limit it in terms of it going, you know. To areas that perhaps were not necessarily in, uh, envisioned by those who who, who approved it. Um, another area where leave entitlement, where there's leave entitlement, is when the employee's been advised by a healthcare provider to self quarantine uh, due to concerns related to COVID-19. So, for instance, someone who, you know, someone who is perhaps uh, on a cruise comes back up from the cruise and is told, you know, that's the self quarantine for 14 days. That may very well be something that would, that would be in, a leave entitlement. Um, employees experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and is seeking and is seeking a medical diagnosis. So, not just it's not just people are fearful of potentially receiving of having COVID-19, but they actually are experiencing the symptoms, um, you know, fever, uh, you know, cough, the um, you know the the various ones that have been posted by the CDC. And uh, you may be aware the CDC has recently expanded. The, the various uh, symptoms of, 
of COVID-19 um, actually kind of makes it, to me, it makes it almost unrecognizable from anything else that people might experience. But it's, I would consider, I would suggest you go see the CDC guidance to see the expansion in terms of what they're looking at as being symptoms of, of COVID-19. In these three cases, the compensation level for paid sick leave is 100% of their regular rate of pay as defined by the FLSA, but it's capped. It's capped at $511 per day or in the aggregate, $5,110 per person. So, so again, if somebody gets this, somebody is eligible for paid sick leave for these three purposes, um, they are eligible for that $500, you know, $511 a day 510, 5110 aggregate. So let's talk now about the uh, other three reasons that an employee may be entitled to uh, emergency paid sick leave. Um, so these are the ones that don't relate to the employee himself or herself, but relate to reasons that are external to the employee. Um, so the number four is that the employee is caring for an individual who is subject to an order or self-quarantine. Um, when we first read these, we said, who the heck is an individual? You know, does this mean, you know, your, your next door neighbor down uh, or, or a neighbor down the street that the employee just decides that they're going to care for gratuitously and that's going to trigger eligibility uh, for emergency paid sick leave? And fortunately, this was one area that we you know, did get some clarification on from the DOL. And what the DOL has said is that this is a person who is uh, an immediate family member, a person who regularly resides in the employee's home, or, and this is the catch-all, um, a similar person with whom the employee has a relationship that creates an expectation that the employee would care for that individual during uh, some type of quarantine. So, you know, some of the folks that may fall into this category, you know, obviously this may be a parent, it could be a sibling, it may be someone like an in-law, maybe an aunt or uncle. Um, those are probably people in the, you know, with familial relationships or, you know, familial relationships by law that we would normally think of. But um, the DOL actually called out, you know, somebody like a roommate as being somebody who, um, you know, the employee may be caring for and that would trigger this um, type of eligibility. Now, the DOL did say as a bone to excluding those who would try to abuse this, that, you know, an individual does not mean someone who the employee has no personal relationship whatsoever. So again, if they decide to go down the street and help out their neighbor for the first time, you know, that's not going to necessarily be somebody that the DOL says is an individual for this reason. Um, you know, I'll also say that the regs make clear that the criteria that we're looking at, that this is a but-for test, meaning that the employee is eligible to take leave for this reason. If but-for the need to care for this individual, the employee would be able to perform the work. So there is somewhat of a higher standard to meet. So reason number five, uh, the employee is caring for a son or daughter if their school or child care provider is closed or unavailable due to um, COVID-19 concerns. So here, um, the definition of son or daughter carries over from the definition we've seen in the FMLA. So this, these are going to include your biological children, adopted children, foster children, um, could even be a stepchild, a legal ward, or someone who the employee stands in loco parenti to. And that's one that we often forget. So this is a, you know, a relationship where the employee may be providing, you know, particular, you know, emotional, mental, and financial support to that child. Um, note that the definition that we saw when it came out originally said it only applied to children who were under 18 years of age. They have gone back to clarify that it also applies to adult children if that child is incapable of caring for themselves due to a physical or a mental disability. So that may be a special circumstance that applies. Um, I'll note that regarding what schools are the types of schools that we're um, you know, looking at in the definition here, these are elementary or secondary schools. So you know, your elementary and middle schools, we're not taught in high schools. We're not talking about schools providing education beyond grade 12. So you know, your folks that are trying to 
say that their college or university students are home due to a college or university closure, that's not going to um, qualify them for leave. Child care provider, some of you know the obvious uh, the obvious folks that we know are within this definition are daycares, for instance. Um, but the the regulations are actually quite broad what they mean. Um, it basically is saying anyone who receives compensation on a regular basis for providing child care services and is subject to state licensure, that's going to be a child care provider. But it also means somebody who isn't compensated or who isn't required to be licensed if it's somebody who is a family member or a friend, like a neighbor, who regularly cares for the employee's child. So, you know, in that circumstance where an employee asks you for leave for this reason, you know, make sure you don't necessarily deny that leave because it's not somebody, you know, it's not a child care provider that um, is closed. Um, so the last one is the employee is experiencing any other substantially similar condition as specified by the, um, the, HHS, the HHS, which is the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, right now, I can't tell you what the heck that means. And I can't tell you what the heck that means because we haven't gotten the definition as to what that means. So, um, you know, obviously the DOL and Congress wanted to leave a carve out here for other circumstances that could come up depending on the severity of things and how they progressed. So it is possible we will get a definition, but um, at this point, we, we don't have a definition. Um, one thing to note here for these reasons, unlike reasons one, two, and three, the uh, amount of paid leave is less. So here it's two thirds of the employee's regular rate and the actual daily caps and the, the aggregate caps are much lower. And one thing I will comment about here, um, for those of you who've ever handled FLSA issues um, and determined what regular rate means, just know that regular rate is a huge misnomer because, um, you know, there, as we recall, there's excludable the non-excludable compensation under the FLSA. So just be careful that when you're calculating an employee's regular rate, that you're thinking about things that, you know, might be being paid right now, like hazard pay or attendance bonuses or special differentials that may apply because of, you know, the circumstances. I'll move to the next slide here. So here's a couple instances where an employee is not going to be entitled to the leave. Um, if they're laid off, they're not going to be entitled. Um, an employee who is furloughed, even if that furloughing may be temporary, is not going to be entitled to the leave. And the DOL's thinking behind that one is that the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act is designed to cover hours that the employee is expected to work. So if they're furloughed, they're not doing work. So um, you know, that's going to be one that may be applicable for your place of business. Of course, you know, don't be furloughing people um, the day after they request leave, um, unless you have a really, really good reason and have called somebody like Pat or me to discuss it, because um, that's probably going to be seen as retaliatory conduct. Um, the also one, the, the next one I'll flag is if they're um, if an employer reduces an employee's hours because they don't have the work for the employee to do, the employee can't use emergency paid sick leave to make up for the hours that they're not scheduled to work. Um, so, you know, don't, don't think that it's something that um, applies in that situation. Um, and finally, the last one, if you've offered the employee to, you know, telework and they have the ability to telework, but they're declining to do so, that's an instance where you, you don't have to provide leave. I'm sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> so, um, with respect to rules usage, uh, you, employers cannot require uh, employees to use accrued paid leave. Um, you know, it, it, those of you who administer the FMLA know uh, in, the, in the normal FMLA uh, situation, you can require people to use uh, paid uh, you know, PTO that they may have uh, as a substitute for the for the leave, here you cannot do that. Uh, not uh, uh, the DOL is very clear, and the law is very clear about that. We'll contrast that with the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act requirements uh, later. Um, you can't require employees to find replacement to cover schedule hours. Uh, you can't require employees uh, to use again to use other paid sick leave, other paid leave before using this paid sick leave. If they want to use this leave. Um, 
they are, you know, they, they have the right to do so. Um, now, one thing is you don't have to allow intermittent usage uh, of the leave. Um, and, uh, you know, right, uh, you may allow it in connection with childcare leave, uh, because obviously the childcare leave lends itself more to intermittent usage as opposed to if you're quarantined or you're, you're um, if you're quarantined or you're, or, or you're, you know, suffering from COVID-19 symptoms, really there's no basis for using intermittent leave. The childcare leave may be different though. Um, you can require, you can uh, ask for documentation. I know the DOL said, you know, the DOL said basically, you know, given, given, you know, how busy physicians are, you know, they, they, you know, you may not get a doctor's note necessarily. You are, but you are permitted to ask for some type of, some type of, uh, uh, of, of substantiation of the need for leave. Um, so, Next uh, slide, okay. Enforcement, uh, it's subject to FLSA. Basically, if you violate the law here, you, um, are, in t you are subject to the same penalties you would have for non-payment uh, of, of wages and or retaliation under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, so in this situation, you might get the unpaid sick leave. If you've terminated somebody improperly uh, in violation of, of, the, of the law, you could get reinstatement and back wages. Um, liquidated damages, which is of course under the Fair Labor Standards Act, is permissible, uh, which is uh, double the amount of uh, back pay or double the amount of lost wages. Um, you're entitled to get that. Um, plus the ever popular attorney's fees and costs. So the plaintiff's lawyer can, um, you know, a plaintiff's lawyer can can get their fees and costs uh, recovered. Uh, there is individual liability in this situation. So somebody who's a supervisor or Sadly, perhaps an HR person who who's responsible for the decision um, can can be potentially liable as an agent of the employer, as as actually an employer under the definition. Um, so, uh, you know, the attorney's fee provision obviously sort of uh, signals that when all this sort of settles down, um, I think we'll we will see a, a significant spike in actions under this law and the other laws we're going to talk about today um, uh, as because I can pretty much guarantee you the way things have gone and the way things sort of came up so quickly in this situation, um, there's probably some technical violation that some employer has done somewhere or something that, you know, when we go back in hindsight, we'll say, you know, they, they may say, well, the employer should have done something differently. And I, I think we will see Attorney, you know, attorneys bringing those types of claims. Um, so, uh, especially with the fee provision. So, I would suggest uh, that you all make sure you you are, if you're subject to this law, you're administering it properly, and you're seeking you're seeking advice as to making sure that you keep up to date with respect to um, how the law is being interpreted. The DOL itself told uh, when the law was passed said, look. We're not going to we're not going to engage in any enforcement proceedings with respect to conduct that may have occurred up until April 17. In, in other words, they gave 30 days from the passage uh, to uh, for for employers to kind of get into compliance. That didn't mean that you could you had that didn't mean you, you weren't supposed to be in compliance April 1st, which was the effective day of the act. It was just that the DOL understood. That if people are in good faith trying to get up and up to speed, they were not going to take an action. Now, just because the DOL didn't enforce it doesn't mean that we might not see private actions, um, even even though even during that sort of DOL uh, uh, grace period. Uh, so anyway, that, just so you know, in terms of the, the DOL is now obviously anything that comes up that they realize or that they believe is a violation, they will seek enforcement. Uh, and potentially seeking the penalties that we just mentioned. Next slide. Okay, so now we're talking about the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act, which was the other piece of the uh, of the FFCRA, uh, and this is you know, this uh, built upon the existing uh, the existing framework of the Family Medical Leave Act, uh, but uh, it, and as we will talk about, was dealing with specifically the issue of caring for children um, 
in the wake of school closures and uh, the uh, lack of uh, childcare in in the wake of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So next next slide. Okay, so um, let's talk about you know the basics of what this leave um, allows. So. Um, unlike the Emergency Paid and Sick Leave Act, we only have one qualifying reason for taking emergency family and medical leave. And, you know, here's where the circumstances apply. But essentially, you know, it's, it's the same as reason number four under the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. So if an employee is unable to work or telework, um, they have to be home because they need to care for a son or daughter who's under 18 years of age. Of course, you know, with the caveats we've talked about, um, you know, the school's closed, childcare is unavailable, and um, it's due to a public health emergency. So, you know, and, and the DOL has clarified that what we mean by that is actually what we meant when we were talking about the emergency paid sick leave, which says due to COVID-19 reasons. So it's, it's very broadly interpreted. Um, so one thing I'll add here is that um, where you see that it says due to the need for leave uh, to care, um, this means that there is no other suitable person to care for the employee's child during the leave period. And um, one thing you should do if you haven't done so already for those that have asked you for this is you know make sure that you're getting this type of representation from the employee in writing. And I say that not only because it's good from a record keeping standpoint, but the IRS has actually said in some of its guidance that you should be getting that representation in writing. So if you don't believe me, listen to the IRS. They're certainly a very scary and powerful. Um, if another spouse or guardian can care for the child, then the employee is not going to be eligible for the leave. And you can feel confident, you know, once you've evaluated that with somebody who is seeking this leave, um, that that is a reason to deny it. Um, another thing that I want to make sure we're all keeping in mind when we're talking about the emergency family medical, uh, the emergency family medical leave uh, emergency act, let's see, I I'm misstating that, um, is that don't forget that the FMLA still is around and it still exists and it still has applicability just like it always has. So if you get an employee who comes to you and they don't qualify for leave under the you know, emergency paid sick leave act, they don't qualify for EFMLA uh, leave, they still may qualify for unpaid FMLA leave. So let's talk about when that might happen. Um, the employee reports to you that their spouse has actually been hospitalized due to COVID-19 testing or treatment. They're still going to qualify for FMLA leave in order to care for their spouse's serious health conditions. So, you know, just make sure that you're staying cognizant of that as these things um, interact. So we've talked a little bit about um, employee and employer coverage with respect to the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. Um, I want to make sure we also cover that with respect to the um, with respect to emergency family medical leave. So emergency family medical leave employer and employee coverage is really different from what it is under the normal FMLA. In fact, a huge swath of employers who've never had to handle any sort of FMLA administration before are now quickly learning the many nightmares that you all go through on a frequent basis and administering this type of leave and making sure that all these various tests and notices are, you know, that we're checking all of those boxes. So um, let's talk about covered employees. So as you know, under normal FMLA, an eligible employee is someone that has worked um, at least 1,250 hours during the 12 months prior to the need to take leave. They work at a location where you have at least 50 or more employees within 75 miles and the employee has worked for the employer for at least 12 months. So now under the emergency family and medical leave, um, we see something entirely different. Any employee who has been on the payroll for the 30 calendar days prior to leave is eligible to take this leave. So this actually means that employees who may have worked less than 30 actual calendar days, but who have been on the payroll for at least 30 calendar days 
are going to be eligible for this leave. Um, one thing to note here is there is a big carve out for those of you who are working in the health or medical industries, or perhaps those of you who work in the public sector. Um, this is the same under the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, but as an employer, you do have the right to exclude someone who otherwise would have been eligible if they are quote unquote a healthcare responder or quote unquote an emergency responder. And we could spend a lot longer today talking about what those definitions mean and some of the arguments for and against those definitions. But just know um, those are people that you can deny this leave to um, for a variety of reasons. I also think that you should pay really special attention to employees that you might have laid off um, as of or after March 1st of this year and who may become reemployed by your company before the end of this year. Um, the DOL has said that employees are eligible for this leave so long as they were on the payroll for 30 or more of the 60 calendar days prior to the date that the employee was laid off and then since become rehired. Um, so again, that's another special circumstance to just, you know, it, there's obviously a very specific test here. So if you see a circumstance like that, just know, hey, maybe this is one of those weird circumstances. Um, with respect to employers, again, um, we have a new test, unlike the, the normal FMLA test, you know, under normal FMLA, we determine if the employer has employed at least 50 or more uh, employees in 20 or more calendar work weeks in the current or preceding calendar year. For EFMLEA, um, we again use the snapshot method. So we're gonna look at the number of employees who were employed at the time that the employee requests leave. Um, again, private employers with less than 500 employees are going to be covered. Public employers where, with at least one employee are going to be covered. And again, just like emergency paid sick leave, we have this small business exemption that we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. One thing I just want to follow up on, on what Justin mentioned about healthcare providers. Um, one, a, a, an area that has been somewhat of a, of a, of a sticking point um, since the DOL came down with, some, with their regulations was healthcare providers, if you look, the definition of a healthcare provider in the act references healthcare provide health references the definition in the ordinary FMLA. And this, this appears, this, this definition appears both in the emergency family medical leave act and in the, um, the paid sick leave act. The, the law said, you know, the, the, they, they reference the definition of healthcare provider in the FMLA, which is a very limited definition. I mean, really it's physicians, um, nurse practitioners, uh, physicians assistants, very, it's a, it's, you know, there's a number of different areas, but it's not anybody who provides healthcare. Um, the law, um, the, 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 the DOL in interpreting the law has really expanded that with respect to exempt, allowing em, uh, employers who are medical employers to exempt employees from coverage under the family, under the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act, as well as the, um, the, the Paid Sick Leave Act. Um, specifically, they, the DOL has said, if you're a medical practice or, or a similar type of, of institution or a business, you can basically decide to exempt all your employees as healthcare provider. Um, again, this is another area that the, that the Democrats in Congress um, have been very upset about. Um, but, the, uh, but the DOL has said, look, you know, if you're a doctor's office, you can basically exempt uh, from coverage um, you know, your doctors, your, you know, nurses, nurse practitioners, your records persons, your receptionist, anybody who works in the office, um, which again is, is a much more expansive definition of healthcare provider than what you would find in the FMLA. So if you are in that industry, if you are a health, in, a, in a medical um, practice or a medical related field, be aware of that, be aware of that potential uh, ability to exempt employees. So, um, so let's talk about the leave entitlement. Okay, so you like the FMLA, you do get up to 12 weeks of job protected leave um, for, in connection with these issues of childcare. Um, the first two weeks or 10 days is unpaid, um, but employees can substitute paid leave there. Uh, employer, 
the employer cannot require um, substitution, although the regulations, um, the DOL has, has, has equivocated on this. So there's, it's really, a, it's not a, and, and Justin, you may, uh, you, you may agree with me on this or not, but I, I don't think it's a settled issue yet whether you can require people to sub, at least not, at least after the first two weeks, that you can require, that the employer could require use of the paid sick leave. Um, the first two weeks, you can't require paid sick leave um, or, or substitution. But again, employees can use paid sick leave. They could use their, those two weeks of the uh, uh, Employee Paid Sick Leave Act leave uh, for, for, for this purpose as well. Um, again, that would be compensated at two thirds of the regular rate of pay as the remaining 10 weeks are. They, they actually can be compensated at two thirds of the regular rate of pay. They're capped at $200, $200 a day or $10,000 uh, for the employee for those 10 weeks. Um, and the regs on the, the DOL's regs, which again, go beyond where the statute says, indicates that you could require people to use the paid sick leave there as long as you paid them their full, uh, their full uh, salary or wages for that week. Um, again, I'm, it's the DOL's regs are contrary to what the statute says, um, but you know at, at this point it can be uh, it can be um, you know it, DOL you can rely upon DOL regs, but I I'm wary given the fact that the, the regs kind of go back and forth at times as to how long you could actually deal with that kind of requirement. So it, to me that's a that's an unsettled area, and I think you need to if you're thinking about doing that. You really need to sit down with counsel and discuss that issue, but that's something for you to be aware of. Um, these the the twelve weeks that you're taking because of the because of this uh, COVID nineteen related issue in terms of childcare is part of. It's not in addition to the regular allotment of twelve weeks. So if you're a otherwise FMLA FMLA covered employer, uh, if somebody takes the twelve weeks here for the childcare piece. Um, that means that that means that they don't necessarily have to. Uh, you, you, that means that you're not required to then, if they come back and say, "I need 12 weeks for some other F, for some FMLA purpose, uh, you know, childbirth, etc." You don't have to grant that because they've already they've already used the 12 weeks in connection with the childcare. So now, where the, again, where the, as, as states there, where the need's foreseeable, uh, the, the employee needs to give as much notice as practical. Um, again, this is obviously there is real short time frames here, but uh, in terms of childcare, things may happen much much uh, quicker than one would, you know, it, not, such that you wouldn't necessarily have the kind of notice that you might have in normal FMLA purposes. But again, as much notice as practical, they have to give. Um, you can require intermittent leave. If the employer agrees to intermittent leave, they can go ahead and do that. Um, and in situations where you've got two parents at home with the children, um, uh, you, you probably would perhaps allow intermittent leave. Perhaps you would do, you know, some one spouse would be responsible for taking care of the children Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the other one Thursday, Friday. And so the person who's sort of not the primary caregiver for the children on those days, on a particular day, would uh, not necessarily have leave that day. But if they are the primary caregiver, you may want to go ahead and give them, allow them to use leave um, for that purpose. Um, employees are entitled to reinstatement and job restoration upon expiration of leave. Um, get 25 or more employees, the same or equivalent position, less than 25 employees either the same position or an equivalent position if there's no one if the original one no longer exists uh, or if there's re or if there's no other position available with a smaller employer like that then um, they have a recall rights for a year um, one thing that you want to think about is and and this is the issue that comes up with respect to um, let's say older children children who are you know high school age you know, can, if somebody can work at home, if somebody, you know, then, you know, if they can telecommute or telework, then there may not be a need for the leave if it's an older child who can basically take care of themselves. Um, uh, and, you know, so you want to, you want to look into, you want to look into 
what's the circumstances surrounding the leave? Is there a way for, for the employee to maximize the work that they're able to do while you're able as an employer to provide them with the, with the uh, maximum level of leave that they need? Um, so, th you know, it's, it, this is not simply just, well, my kids are out of school, I, so I get 12 weeks now. It's basically, all right, the children are out of school, but how old are they? What kind of supervision do they need? Um, and, and also what kind of, uh, you know, what can people do in the work? What can people do in terms of work from home? So is there, a, is there an ability to work at least part of the time and then give leave the other part of the time? So you can be creative in this area. It's not a, don't, don't feel like you have to, you know, provide a 12 week block if somebody just happened to have a school age child there. Uh, but again, you might be in a situation where it's a young child, it's a single parent, they don't have childcare. Um, you know, the you know maybe gr you know grandma usually watches the kids, uh, but you know, given that she's a senior citizen, you know she might not be able to. You know, she may not uh, leave. You might want well, she might not leave the ho her house uh, because of a stay at home order, or you know, there's concern about you know COVID nineteen, so she's not available. Um, that you know, that situation you might have to give you know full blown block of time leave, but in other situations you may have some more flexibility. So uh, we talked about a lot of you know specific requirements that we have to follow, and undoubtedly, even the most well intentioned of you know HR generalists, managers, supervisors. You know, there's probably going to be some cases where um, we, you know, we just miss the boat. So, um, you know, what's going to happen if we screw up on accident? And unfortunately, what I have to share with you is that the same penalties that we see under the FMLA are also under emergency FMLA. Um, so the unpaid time that they don't get, um, reinstatement, back wages, liquidated damages, which is just a really fancy word for double damages, and the um, always notorious and infamous attorney's fees, which in a lot of these cases can uh, be the, 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 you know, the horse driving the cart, so to speak. Um, you know, if there is a silver lining um, to any of this, it's that at least for those employers who have less than 50 employees, you know, the folks who have never had to experience FMLA administration, um, we did get a carve out to say that uh, with respect to those employers, that private lawsuits cannot be brought by employees. And that's a real big win um, because it basically leaves any enforcement to the Department of Labor. And whether they get their own action, it's going to be a convoluted determination, but resource based um, and really is unlikely. Um, so, you know, that's a win for smaller employers who may be worried about, oh my goodness, I've never done this before. You know, we might screw this up. Um, you know, the other silver lining and Pat's touched on this a little bit is that, you know, during the meet of when all these new FAQs were being published and, you know, we got the new regulations, we did sort of get this grace period, you know, through April 17th. Um, so long as you were making a good faith and reasonable attempt to comply. Um, of course, we're now past that grace period. So the DOL has made very clear that any lift or, or any day non-enforced lifted, and they now intend to fully enforce any and all possible violations. Um, so, you know, if you haven't really taken a look at this before today. Um, now we do so. Be very well um, in tomorrow who is going to seek to take some of this leave. So there are notice requirements under the act. Um, in, you know, where you, let's assume for a moment you have employees that are still reporting to the work site. Um, the DOL requires that you post a notice in a conspicuous place. So this, this should be in the same location that you make all of your other required postings, um, you know, in an employee break room or something to that effect, maybe by the copier where people go in and out. Um, 
but obviously a lot of folks are staying home. And for those people who you know, may not be aware, um, you also have the option of distributing this notice to employees by email. Um, you can also post it on an employee intranet, for example. You can also directly mail the notice um, to the employee if for some reason they will not have access to it through any, another, uh, any other means. Um, one other thing I will tell you is that the DOL has created this very um, beautiful looking notice that I'm sure they spent a lot of taxpayer money to design. But if for some reason you have a really difficult time using the DOL's notice, um, you, you do have the option of creating a different form of the notice, but you have to still make sure that the content you're including in it is accurate and is actually readable. So um, I, I will tell you, there are folks that would try to put this in six or eight font type where you, you can't even make out that that's a notice. So that, that's, that's gonna be a no-no and a bad idea. Um, you know, the F, F, FFCRA has also said that you don't have to provide translated versions of this notice, but at least at this point, we do have a Spanish language version of the poster that's available online. Um, if you have employees that speak Spanish and that's their first language, I, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't make that available to them. Um, and, and I don't know if they've published other languages as of this afternoon, but I, I don't believe they have. It's better. It's better to use their. It's better to use the the DOL's notice because they they can't come after you saying that you gave bad note. You gave a bad notice because you just point back and say this is the one you gave us. So yeah, yeah. It's always. It's always. I mean, it, it's 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 not bad to give your own notice if you want to be more comprehensive, perhaps. But I don't know. I. I kind of like having, I kind of like using their notices, it just it's safer. Yeah, I, Pat, I completely agree. Um, I actually had a client come to me and, um, you know, wanted to highlight the things that were quote unquote beneficial to the employer and, um, you know, try to manipulate the form to not be so obvious with respect to other things. If you can believe that that actually happened, uh, it did. So um, I completely agree. I think your safest bet is to use the, uh, the DOL provided notice. You can't go wrong there. Um, so let's talk about this small business exemption. Um, one thing that we really need to talk about is that, um, you know, the small business exemption wasn't as um, broad as we had perhaps hoped. Um, so, you know, with the emergency paid sick leave, I just want to harp on again, um, only with respect to an employee who is taking the leave to care for you know, their child because of school or childcare closing, can you utilize this small business exemption? Otherwise, for any of the other reasons provided in the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, um, the bad news I have to share with you is that you're stuck. Um, you're stuck providing it um, as long as the other criteria for eligibility are met. Um, you know, again, the exemption does exist too for emergency family medical leave. Um, so you can use it for that purpose. But we're only talking about an exemption that deals with that very limited purpose of an employee being gone to care for his or her child. So the regulations in telling us what this looks like set out these three criteria that have to be, um, or, or let me restate, um, one of these three criteria has to be met in order to qualify for the small business exemption. You do not have to meet all three. Um, so you'll see the first one is that um, expenses and revenue um, are such that the employer is not going to be able to operate even at a minimum capacity. Um, the second criteria is that if this person was on leave, that there be some type of substantial risk to the employer's operations because of that employee's very specialized skills, knowledge of the business or responsibilities. The easiest way I can relate this one to you is this is probably somebody who would be like a key employee under the FMLA analysis. So somebody really special and critical to the employer's operations, that's what this is talking about. Um, and then finally, um, the employer can't find enough willing, available, able, and qualified workers to perform the work um, of the employee who's requesting the absence. So this is a situation where, you know, but for that employee being there, nobody else can do the work and the work has to be done. So, you know, this is the framework we've been given. There's obviously a lot of gray area between what we have here. And, you know, whether or not your small business would potentially qualify is going to be an individualized assessment. 
you know, your business is going to have circumstances that are unique to your operations. So I would say this is one where pick up the phone and call somebody, call legal counsel and, you know, talk this through and make sure this makes sense for you and that you can back this up. And the reason I say you need to make sure you can back this up is because the DOL has said, if you're going to use this small business exemption, you have to document why you qualified for one of these three criteria. And in addition to documenting it, oh, by the way, you're going to have to keep that on record for at least four years. So obviously the DOL, um, they wanted to provide some protection to small businesses, but they really wanted to hone in on, these are specialized circumstances where, you know, the business, the ongoing operations of the business are really in jeopardy if you're going to have to provide this leave. Um, and I will tell you in, in truthfulness, you know, if you're a small business and there's a one-off employee who needs to take this leave, it's probably going to be pretty hard to argue that some of these things apply unless they're, you know, a very specialized person in your organization. Um, so just something to think about there. And I, I would sort of echo Justin's comments on that. The, the, I think that when you look at the reason why the exception for the less than 50 is only limited to sort of this child care piece. I think it's, my thought was, it's basically, you know, and my talking with clients over the last several weeks and dealing with this stuff, it seems that the issue is they, most employers don't worry about the two weeks sick leave because obviously if somebody's sick with COVID-19, they don't, you know, it, it's, they don't, they're not gonna come into work. The employee, employers don't want them into work. And you know, two weeks is not as big uh, is not as big a chunk uh, of time. Um, the The problem has been, I think, and also because, uh, and fortunately in Central Florida, I think this has been the case. There had, you know, the, the fortunately has not been, as, you know, the illnesses have not been as widespread as was initially, you know, where the you know other locations, uh, and what was initially thought for here in in Central Florida. Um, so most of my clients have been sort of not as concerned about that. This piece, the the sick, the childcare piece, has been the has been the thing that most employers have been concerned about because a it's more widespread, and b um, it, it's it's much more uh, it, it's mu it, it's a lot more time. I mean, it's six times mm -hmm. the amount of time that people are entitled to be out. And you know, and if you've got if you are a smaller employer and you've got a lot of people who you know, who might fit the bill for this, you, you, you might hit that first, you might hit that first situation where, you know, the expenses and financial obligations, you know, are, you know, forcing the employer to even work, you know, continue because it's just, or that there's nobody around to do the work. Um, so I think that's why, again, what my experience has been sort of that my, the clients I've talked with, this has been the issue that they've had the most, they've had more concern with this issue than with the sick leave. But Again, and that may be recognizing that this is a much more expansive leave is probably why the DOL and why the law kind of limited the, the, the small business exemption to this particular piece. So, I'm sorry, so I, my editorializing is done, so let me go on to the next piece here. Um, tax credits. The silver lining is that, the, first of all, that these payments are are exempt from the from uh, social security tax, the employer social security tax. So you don't, there's not a requirement that you have to pay your your piece of this of the social security, um, and you can offset the amounts of leave that are paid uh, up to uh, up to those caps in terms of the amount, uh, you know, the amounts of you know the 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 five you know the five hundred dollars a day or the you know, or the two hundred dollars a day. Um, Covered employers also will be reimbursed if their costs for the for payments exceed their payroll taxes that they're required to deposit. So there's a so there is a there is a there are credits here. You know the government is while they're telling mandating the paid leave, they are providing ways for employers to at least recoup those expenses through tax issues. Okay, so we're going to move on to some other things outside of the. FFCRA and things that you know, I'm sure that you all are dealing with. The first thing is dealing with furloughs. Um, you know, I've been practicing, I hate to say, 32 years. 
uh, and this is the first time really that I've been dealing a lot with furloughs as opposed to layoffs. Most most of our most people lay off folks as opposed to furloughing. Furloughs are essentially an unpaid leave of absence um, it, versus a layoff, which is where you're severing the employment relationship. Uh, the employee, when you furlough somebody, they remain your employee. Uh, a lot of employer, you know, they, they would remain eligible for health benefits. A lot of employers who have put people on furloughs have said they're going to continue to pay for their health benefits. Um, now, if, if they don't pay for their health benefits and they just put them on furlough, uh, and because of the reduction in hours, they're no longer, you know, the employee's no longer eligible for benefits, um, you know, you might have a COBRA issue at that point. Um, and so, but you want to, but it, again, most, a lot of employers that I've been dealing with have been as part of the furlough saying, look, we're going to, you know, we're not going to pay you anything. You're not going to be working, but we're going to keep you on health benefits as long as we can. One thing you should do if you have a, fur, if you put people on furlough and are pro keeping them under their health care benefits is that you should talk with your, you should talk with your health, uh, your insurance provider to make sure that you can keep folks on the benefit, how long you can keep folks on the benefits because some plans, you know, will work, some plans will say, look, you know, if you haven't worked for a certain period of time, you're no longer eligible to be covered under the, under, under the health plan. And that usually, that issue usually comes up, unfortunately, at the, at the back end when somebody is, you know, has, has suffered some illness and maybe COVID-19 related illness. Um, and then when they put in for their insurance, the insurance company says, well, these, this person wasn't working 20 hours a week or whatever the minimum is, um, so we're not going to cover them. You want to make sure that if you're going to, if you're going to offer employees uh, health benefits while they're on furlough, that your health insurance provider will, in fact, consider them covered. Uh, and will, you know, if they don't, then, when, then again, you need to talk about going to perhaps issuing COBRA uh, Cobra notices, and you may pay for the co you may decide to pay for the Cobra premium. Again, talk with your health insurance provider to make sure that you don't have this situation come up where, you know, at some point the employees, you know, out of pocket because because they really weren't, you know, the insurance company is taking a no coverage uh, no coverage position. Um, employees on furlough are eligible for unemployment compensation. Uh, here in Florida, they can. They can apply for unemployment compensation. Uh, those of you who uh, have been following the, the CARES Act, which was the other major piece of litigation that was uh, passed uh, in connection with the, the response to COVID-19, um, know that there has been expanded insurance benefits provided, um, especially uh, you know the federal. The, the, I think the one that people realize, think about the most is under there is a separate federal benefit that if you are entitled to unemployment compensation. Uh, you get your unemployment benefits under the state law, plus you get an additional $600 a week in federal benefits, and that's through the end of July. Um, and so, um, you know, which uh, for some employers has created somewhat of a concern that, um, you know, it, it's for some employees, it's actually, it's actually uh, more lucrative for them to be on unemployment than it is to, uh, um, to, 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 to continue working. So, that's something that a lot of employers have had to had to struggle with. Um, hey, Pat and Justin, this is Linda. I yes. just wanted to let you know we're at that seven o'clock time, and we do have a few Q and A's um, that we do want to do. So I just want to give you a heads up that we do have some questions from the audience. So all those questions, and and we'll certainly get to them. Um, I, you know, we'll, we'll I'll try to pick up the pace and 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 we get to them. But we certainly will get to whatever questions people have. Um, uh, and I'm on, yeah, I'm sure we're both willing to stay until we get that done. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so WARN Act, is, when you furlough people, are, is the WARN Act implicated? Or if you lay people off temporarily, let's say. Um, there are two issues to look at with respect to the WARN Act. Well, first of all, those, those of you who are subject to the WARN Act is, are all employers with 100 or more full-time employees um, and that means that means anybody who works more than 20 hours a week, or has been working at the employer for six months or more, um, uh, and so any employer who's got over 100 employees, if they close a if they close a facility or they lay people off at a particular facility, at least 50 
employees, and with the layoff, it's at least 50 and a third of the workforce, typically you have to give 60 days notice. Um, now, the situation is here is with respect to furloughs and layoffs, I mean, you're, you're, you're basically telling people not to come into work, and, and a lot of times it's probably far in excess of 50 employees. Um, there are two pieces to look at. If you're, if, you're, if you're terminating, if you're furloughing somebody or laying people off and the expectation is that it's going to be less than six months, a layoff or a reduction in hours of less than six months is not seen as an employment loss under Warren and therefore doesn't trigger the Warren Act in terms of the 60-day notice. Now, the problem is what happens if you, you say, well, we anticipate the, the furlough to be 30 days, then it goes 60 days, 90 days, and, and, and hopefully it doesn't keep going. Hopefully people are going to get back to work soon. But let's say it continues. At some point, you need to sit down with your counsel and determine, you know, should we send out a 60 day notice? Should we send out a warn notice now? Because we're not sure we're going to be bringing these people back after 60 days. <clears throat> uh, you know, after six months, I mean, I'm sorry, after six months. So should we get that 60 days notice out there? Um, and if, if you decide to do that, then you need to get, uh, you would put the notice out as soon as you really kind of decide that, look, this is going to expand, this is going to go beyond six months. It, and, you know, you may, you may be in a situation where you may not have enough time that you know, may not have 60 days to, to, to let's say you decide you're going to have your business is your business is so poorly impact so badly impacted that you say, well, we need to just fire, you know, fire a bunch of people now. Um, what one you may not have to give 60 days notice if you can argue that there was an unforeseen business circumstance. In other words, there was a dramatic decrease in business caused by the pandemic. That we were that was not foreseen, and therefore that required us to to lay off people in excess of 50. But you have to, if if you do have unforeseen business circumstances, you still have to give notice. It's just you have to give as much advance notice as you can. Um, so if you've if you've got folks on furlough, keep your eye on Warren because it's important to that you may you you don't want to stumble into a situation where it's triggered because if it's triggered, there's an argument that. You, you should have given war notice back when the, when the furlough or the layoff was initially done. Um, and that can create, again, you know, significant penalties and, and, and liability for the employer. Yeah. So one, the big question on everybody's mind, or <laughs> at least one that's being talked about extensively um, at a national and now state level is, um, what do we do about reopening? Do we reopen? How do we reopen? What does that look like? And all of the questions that are no doubt going to come from the, you know, this issue of bringing people back to work and things getting back to quote unquote normal. Um, the first recommendation I can give you is of course, continue to monitor um, guidance by the CDC regarding what are the things you should be evaluating to determine if you should be open or not? You know, they've published guidance not too long ago saying that there's really three questions you should be thinking about. Um, are you in a community no longer requiring significant mitigation measures? Can you limit non-essential employees to those um, who are in the local geographic area? And do you have protective measures in place for employees that are at higher risk? And, you know, the CDC's position is you should only consider reopening if you can answer yes to each of those three questions. Now, I do think that's a little bit of an exercise in futility, because as we all know, there are just going to be businesses that are ready to open no matter what. Um, and at least here in the state of Florida, you know, DeSantis's, uh, Governor DeSantis's stay at home order is set to expire on Thursday. And as of today, we still don't know what, if anything, we will have in its place starting after Thursday. Um, so here are some things to think about if you're, you know, in that category of folks that's going to be reopening shop. Um, one is social distancing. Should you continue to practice social distancing? And the answer is yes, you should, to the extent that you can. Um, and to the extent that you can't limit social distancing to six feet, you know, consider taking measures that would allow you to do the best in the circumstances. Um, you know, making sure we're practicing good, 
you know, we've got good intensive cleaning procedures in place and disinfection. Um, maybe we're staggering when employees report to work. Maybe we're limiting shared items that are being used. Train all staff in, you know, the various safety measures that we can use to limit transmission. Um, we've obviously seen some businesses using plexiglass to physically divide people when, you know, they can't use the six foot rule. You know, those are all things to be thinking about and things that you absolutely can use in your workplace to, you know, still engage in social distancing as best you can. I, I will share with you that there actually has been, um, there was a reported case out of the West Coast where an employee filed an OSHA charge because the employer was not encouraging and requiring its employees to engage in social distancing. So um, those types of charges and cases, they are coming. And you very, very well have an employee who was seriously concerned about being at work and the employer not taking necessary steps to, you know, ensure that the workplace is safe to work at. So you definitely want to still do those things. Um, personal protective equipment. A um, bunch of questions we've seen there. Can you require an employee to wear a face mask or covering? Yes, you can. But be mindful of special circumstances that may pop up. Um, one of which is you may have an employee that says that due to some medical condition, they are unable to wear a face mask. You know, maybe they have some breathing disability that prevents them from wearing a face mask or face covering. Um, if that should happen, that's a situation where you move forward in the ADA interactive process and at least try to evaluate um, what the reasons are for why the employee is refusing to do so, you know, and take that um, in good faith and try to come to some type of a resolution. Alternatively, if you uh, as a workplace want to require all of your employees to wear a face mask or face covering and you have some that refuse, one question that's been asked is, you know, what can we do? Um, and, you know, in that situation, if you do have a policy in place that, that does require it um, and there is no special extenuating circumstance for an employee to refuse to wear the face mask, you can proceed with disciplinary action under your policy. I do recommend though that you do think about putting a policy in place that talks about why wearing a face mask or face covering is important. Um, all, there are, believe it or not, some employers that don't want to require um, their employees to wear face masks. And you know, one of the situations or one of the questions that we've been asked is, um, can an employer um, you know, basically tell the employee that they can't wear the mask or they refuse the request to wear a mask. And, you know, technically speaking, from the legal analysis we've done, the answer is the employer would still have that ability, but we really don't recommend that you deny that request. Um, given the CDC's guidance from April 3rd, saying that all Americans should be wearing a cloth face, a cloth face covering, you know, at the very least, we should be allowing employees to do that. Um, the next big item, the, the elephant in the room, the employee that's scared to come to work. You know, what do we do? Um, and the best way to think about this is, you know, OSHA has said that employees are only entitled to refuse to come to work if they believe they are in quote unquote in imminent danger. And while that has a very specific legal definition behind it, um, you know, uh, the gist of it is that the danger we're talking about is it's expected to cause death or serious, you know, bodily harm. And, um, you know, COVID-19, arguably in some circumstances, might rise to that level. Probably the easiest example I can give to you where the imminent danger threshold might be met is if you are um, in the medical industry and you have an employee who is on a regular basis interacting with patients and that employee is not being provided PPE, um, that would probably be a situation where the imminent danger threshold is going to be met. Now, most work conditions in the US though are probably not going to meet those elements where an employee can refuse to come to work. And this is why you know, doing those other things we talked about, encouraging social distancing, making sure we have all of the means and methods in place to do the best to reduce transmission, those all come into this analysis of, is there an imminent danger in the employee reporting to work? Because no doubt, the more we do to reduce possible transmission, the more likely it is that someone will come to work in a safe way, and they won't be at risk of death or great bodily harm, 
you know, because of a COVID-19 um, infection. Working remotely, um, yeah, ADA analysis changed forever. Absolutely. Um, I think it's safe to say that the law on this is probably forever going to change, given that positions that employers would previously um, tooth and nail fight to say could never be done remotely. We are, su we are seeing not only done remotely, but being done remotely just as well as what could have been done in the workplace. And um, as much as I hate to say it, going forward, we're going to have to really be cognizant about what do we do with those employees who request the telecommute as a form of accommodation. Um, let me move to the next one so we can keep track on time here. Uh, the EEOC has issued a bunch of technical guidance that relates to testing employees for, you know, body temperatures that exceed, you know, normal body temperatures. Just continue to monitor that. You know, generally speaking, you can ask if they're experiencing symptoms so that you um, eliminate possible future transmission in the workplace. You can measure body temperature and test employees. Um, you can send employees home who might be exhibiting symptoms. The big thing here, though, is, you know, we want to do our best to limit what information we are keeping in the workplace and maintaining that confidentiality and privacy as best we can as we go about it and making sure that everybody is going about this in a safe way. So, you know, if you're going to have employees that are taking temperatures, these are the folks that you really should have, you know, be providing them PPE um, so that they can do this in a safe way when an employee has a temperature that might exceed, you know, 100 degrees, have some type of process in place, you know, so the employee tests over the, the normal limit. What are you going to do? Um, where are they going to go? Who's going to talk to them? How are they going to talk to them? Um, those are all things that you definitely uh, should be thinking about. And, and obviously, you know, there's a lot more to unpackage here, but, um, you know, just be thinking about it and keep monitoring the EEOC for, for future guidance. Okay, Justin, are we at the point, this is Linda, are we at the point we can have Pam jump in and do a little bit of Q&A moderation for us? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm sorry, I was gonna say, yeah, I, I mean, I'm fine with that, Justin. I mean, I, the pay, payroll protection program is, you know, it, it's it's probably not as necessarily as HR, -y, as H, HR related as, as as the other issues we've done. Um, just, I, do you, I mean, are you okay with that? Yeah, we can, we had two more slides. Um, yeah. You know, um, so yeah, I'm fine moving on that. Let's yeah. um, let's yeah, advance. Just, just just know the payroll protection plan uh, protection program uh, okay. program is out there, um, and then also just the there's some payroll tax credits. So uh, just you know, a pay, a payroll deferrals. Um, so we can talk about that in the Q and A if you want, and then um, and then I think uh, as you saw in one of the slides there, you know. I, We'll shamelessly promote both our firm's uh, COVID-19 <laughs> resources um, in terms of uh, uh, you've got a lot of great lawyers at both firms uh, working very hard on this stuff, uh, as, as you do at other firms, too. I mean, you, if you, you know, your own firm, you know, if you don't use one of us, your own firm probably is very effective in terms of putting together resources like that. So, you know, go visit your COVID, go visit your law firm COVID resource, resource center, I would tell you daily, because there's always updates. So, anyway, I'm sorry. All right, uh, thank you, Pat and Justin. I uh, wanna ask uh, a couple, some of the questions. Um, this first one is, uh, I'm in government contracting, DOD. I have two employees that will not go to work due to the virus. However, however, they are considered essential personnel. Do we need to pay them for the two weeks since they are essential? Everyone else is showing up to work. Th are, they not, are they not showing up are they not showing up just because they they're afraid of the virus of getting the virus? I mean, that's one question. And the secondly, can they work from home? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, this goes back to you know the topic we talked about of you know this imminent danger requirement, and um, you know I think exploring some of the circumstances as to why they don't want to come to work. You know, is this a well-founded fear for why they don't want to come to work? Is this because of, you know, they're in a high risk category that they don't want to come to work? You know, those are some of the questions that you should be asking to make sure that, you know, we're not going to be 
turn, you know, allowing every employer who has, or every employee, excuse me, who has some fear about the virus to not return to work. Because, you know, if we're taking all the proper safety measures, you know, that's going to eliminate the danger. All right, thank you. Next, um, we have, can emergency FMLEA be intermittent or must it be continuous? I think, we, I, think we answer, I think we answered that. So um, okay. it, it can be, the emergency family medical leave uh, can, can, be, can, can be intermittent. The employer and the employee can agree. And, and again, it may be, it may, that may be a function of what the reality of the childcare situation is. Okay. Yeah, it does require the agreement of the employer though. So um, just, you know, if an employee requests it and you have a reason to not allow it to be intermittent, you do have the right to deny it. Okay. Has the deal created forms the employee must use to request either the F E F M A or the E P S L A? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> um, and, and listen, you know there are some forms circulating out there. Some are better than others. Um, you know, I would just say. If you're going to need a form, um, that's something that Pat or I could definitely talk to you about. You know, there's some better forms out there and some worse forms, you know, some not so good forms out there. And, you know, there's definitely questions you should ask um, on the form itself. So uh, unfortunately, though, I, to the person who asked that, uh, you're giving way too much credit to the DOL. <laughs> and, and actually, in, in their defense, I mean, they've been they've been turning stuff out at a breakneck speed. I mean. We've, true, we've, true. we've seen legislation and regulatory guidance come out in a matter of a month, which you, this would usually take, I would, I would say would take at least a year. Um, so so we're, everybody's doing everything on the fly. And, and again, we, you see that at the state level with a lot of these, these stay-at-home orders and you know, definitions of various businesses. It's just, you, you know, the, the government, you know, both federal, state, and local governments are, you know, trying to address a, an issue that is unprecedented in breakneck speed. All right. We have a question. Uh, does it apply to Medicare tax employer portion? Well, I, I think that has to do with the, um, that, I think that had to do with the pay, uh, the, the credit uh, that you get for the, um, the, uh, the sick leave and the, and the family medical leave. My understanding is that it's the social security tax. I don't, I'm not sure about the Medicare piece. I don't, I know for instance, um, I know for instance, when it comes to the, there's the payroll tax deferral, um, that only applies to social security and not Medicare. I, I can't, I, I, I don't, I don't believe Medicare is part of the, uh, of the tax credit, but I, I don't quote me on that. Um, but that's just my sense of it based upon what happened with the other, with the other law. All right. Um, in terms of employer paid sick leave, is the employer's pay 100% or the EE con contribution to continue coverage during furlough? What was that? What was that? Yeah. Can you repeat that, Pam, or shoot it over to us? I'm sorry. Yeah, in terms of the employer paid sick leave, is the employer pay, is it, is that the employer pays 100% or the employee contribution to continue coverage during furlough? So, oh, well, if an, if an employee's on, if an employee's on paid sick leave, um, the employer pays for that. Um, you know, and, and so the, the, the issue about furlough if somebody's on furlough, they're not entitled to the paid sick leave. Um, so, so the, you know, uh, so I, I, so they're not going to, they're not going to get anything. The, the, the issue about furlough um, tends to be, um, tends to be that if you're on furlough, maybe the employer covers your health insurance benefit. Um, and, and again, that, as I mentioned, you should talk, you should talk with your insurance provider to make sure that you can do that, um, but so, but if you're if you're not if you're not um, if you're on if you're on furlough, you're not entitled to the sick leave. I hope that okay. answers the question. I, I saw who answered it. Hopefully, hopefully that I saw who asked it. So hopefully that answers it. Okay. 
One of the things now, we have several other questions, but and, um, due to time, what we're gonna do is capture all the questions and uh, provide them to Pat and Justin um, to respond to, and we'll send that out um, to those that have attended. Um, Justin um, has, uh, sh is showing you the uh, professional credits. Uh, this has been certified by both SHRM and um, HRCI um, for you. I want to uh, wrap this up by thanking both of you, uh, Justin and Pat, um, very informative session. I appreciate um, you guys taking the time to do this for us. And again, um, you know, know that you get more questions heading your way um, <laughs> to respond. Um, we'll send those out to you. Um, wanted to um, make sure I thank our sponsors. We had uh, Manta Strip Consulting from March and this month, University of Phoenix uh, for being our sponsors. Yes. Next up for GoSherm, we do have the mental health component. Uh, coming up next week, um, next uh, Tuesday, May 5th, same time, we'll send that information out and uh, so that registration can uh, take place. That is another free um, event that GoSherm is sponsoring for uh, our membership and others. Uh, after that, our regular meeting time uh, is normally May 19th, but more than likely it's gonna be virtual also. That is going to be leading through crisis. Um, being facilitated by uh, Kelly Mebler. Um, and I'm so sorry, I didn't mention um, the May 5th event is going to be Psychological Empowerment 360, How to Survive and Thrive in Crisis. And that's going to be uh, facilitated by the Mineral Hygiene Project. Uh, next, uh, I do want to do a special thank you also, as Nate stated, to Latanya and Linda and Janine for their support and help. And with me in this program, I would not be able to do it without them. I uh, truly appreciate them. Um, thank you for joining. This is our first virtual. There were some kind of glitches in the beginning, but we'll make sure we fix those and hope you um, enjoyed it. We are gonna send you a survey and ask you to respond and, and let us know what we can do to make it better. And uh, turn it over to Nate. No, I didn't need the mic again. I was, uh, you, you could wrap it up. I, I will, I, if you want me to close, I will. Uh, uh, Pat, Justin, thank you so much. Uh, Fisher Phillips, Baker Hosteller, you guys are awesome. The, the uh, content that both of your organizations are putting out via email is, has been amazing. So for everyone on the call, if you are not uh, getting those, uh, those emails, uh, go, go to their websites and, and get that. And uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Again, LaTanya, uh, Pam, Linda, Janine, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much. We love you members. And uh, we have some non-members. So you guys come back and see us uh, next week. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Night, everybody. Good night.
And I think we still have a couple of people that hung on. I see about 11 participants. This is Linda Hamilton. And um, I will take all of these additional chats that we see in. And uh, just wanted to let you know and, and say goodnight to everyone. And we will see you next time.